Fellow tennis nerds, uh, welcome to another episode of the Tennis Nerd Podcast. Today I'm here with a distinguished guest, Grisha Gladiators Tennis. You've seen him maybe play with Medvedev, Grublev. He's playing on the UTR, on the ITF, and he also does racket reviews and other stuff on his YouTube channel. There, it's always great content, like really well edited. Do you do your own thumbnails, for example, if we start there? Uh, actually, my sister does the, the thumbnails for me, so yeah. But They're very good. Doing Very like good. that to create some competition for, for you, Jonas, on, on the racket reviews, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you need, you need that. No, there's a lot of competition. Like, everyone is doing racket reviews these days, I think. Yeah. It's, uh, which is good because, I, you know, it's, it's, for a while it was just pretty much me and then Tennis Warehouse and, and right. not, not that much else. You need, like, other voices out there. I think it's important. So you're in Barcelona now. Like, what's, uh, what's happening in, in the tennis world of Brescia? Uh, in the tennis world of Grisha, uh, I mean, not not much competitive is going on. I am not planning to play any in any ITFs anytime soon. I don't. I'm not signed into any futures, but I am gonna play a UTR as we just talked about it. I'm gonna play a UTR beginning of August. I think it starts on the first of August. Uh, see how that goes. I played my first UTR back in March, and I loved the format of of the tournament. I loved. Also, got to say, I love the prize money of the tournament because, <laughs> unlike on the futures, you, you know, you actually win something, uh, and and yeah, I guess I guess we'll see how it goes, but uh, definitely looking forward for it, to it. Do you think the UTR format is something that we'll see a lot more because they they are really gaining some steam, and we we mentioned it before we went on like recording mode, uh, that it's like where you know if there's money in it, it will be tough for ATP to compete maybe. Right. I mean, if there's money is one thing obviously right but nobody plays futures for the money people play futures for for the atp points and what gives them ranking and and the chance to to get into the higher league tournaments and uh for now utr is not really offering any atp points but i feel like if in some kind of scenario atp points are introduced and well atp wta because there's also right the 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 female tour uh and wta points are introduced into the utr uh i I'm really struggling to understand how how ITF would keep up with that because obviously uh, the the prize money is way way more tempting. The fact that you can play uh, at least five matches per tournament is is really good because you gain that experience. You know, uh, I told you that I've seen I've seen several players who who went from you know playing decently well to playing really well and winning ATP points further on after just playing one UTR because you know you end up playing with at least five players who play at that futures level and and you can you know maybe the first match doesn't go as planned or like goes pretty well but then you end up you know getting the rhythm and starting to feel the ball better and you understand that okay i'm actually playing at the level with with these guys so i, I guess my level is pretty good and and that gives you confidence and you know confidence is everything in tennis so uh so yeah utr in on that aspect is is definitely uh great money I'm not, I'm still, I didn't go too deep into the money side of things, even though that's probably the most important side of things, right? Uh, I know that Oracle is in, has invested a lot of money. I think I, I read something like 20 million over two years or something like that. I, I've heard these numbers and then also Novak had to do something with UTR. So, you know, uh, but if, if it's only coming from, you know, just people sort of fi uh, financing it, it's not going to work too well. I also heard that, you know, the betting companies are kind of, uh, somehow paying you know for for those matches to be displayed on their website so if that can actually work out utr is gonna you know be very uh a very successful uh thing but you know if it doesn't we'll see yeah it's interesting that you can actually get the the matches streamed like i mean you mentioned that in your video and i think that's that's one great point that you can follow the matches you you have great exposure sometimes you have futures you you know you have a score but you don't know anything here you can get the accessibility, so you can also watch, you know, your favorite player or like someone you know play a prize money tournament, and that creates a lot of lot better accessibility. And I think it's also easier to sell it as a product then. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, like not only for me, as I said in the video, that it's easier that I don't have to edit the scoreboard into it and then record my own highlights, you know, uh, but also for your family, friends, for your coach as well, you know, because I've actually had several. Uh, several players on tour come, coming up to me and being like, what do you use to record your videos? Like, because I, I want to record my uh, my uh, match to show it to my coach because, you know, I can't afford traveling with a coach. So, like, let me know. With UTR, that problem is solved. They can literally watch you, you know, play and you don't have to be playing a challenger for, for them to see. And again, that's that's something really cool. And also for the for the highlights for your Instagram and stuff, it's it's definitely nice. 
Yeah, it seems cool. And I uh, hope you play more events so we can we can follow your, your journey there. Uh, yeah. What's been your experience when playing ITF events like Future? So you did one video which was interesting where you had to eat a lot of McDonald's because there were no other <laughs> no yeah. <many> options. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that was uh, surprisingly, that was the most successful Future so far that I have played, you know, because that was the only one where I actually passed the qualies. Got quite unlucky in the in the first round of main draw, uh, getting a guy who, who was ex top 300. So, you know, he kind of kind of wrecked me. Uh, but, but, you know, uh, well, it's it's kind of a no, no surprise to anyone at this point that, you know, ITF beginner futures uh, pro tournaments are are not the most pleasant thing to be playing. Right. Because obviously hospitality is not included, no food, no you know transportation. You have to figure everything out by yourself. And uh, as we said before, the prize money is, uh, uh, yeah, something to be. Um, you know, not something to be looking forward either because playing qualifyings, you, you don't win anything, right? Like zero. And, and that's at least four days that you have to be staying in the tournament, right? Because you have to be there uh, the day before the first match because, well, sign in. Obviously, now it's done by phone. You used to have to, like, actually sign. Now it's done by phone. But still, you want to be there to, you know, kind of feel the court, feel the balls, feel the atmosphere. Then first, second, third round of qualifying, that's four days that you're not getting paid and you have to pay for the hotel, for the food and, and for stringing, right? And, and, and oh, even stringing gets really expensive, right? Because some people charge like 20 euros for what? Like 20 euros to string a racket? What are you talking about? Uh, but yeah, so that's four days that you have to be paying for your everything. And then if, if you get into the main draw, Mm, I think the prize money, I played like Sanchencho, right? For losing in the first round of main draw, I think I got like 200, say 50 euros, which, well, which is nothing, right? <laughs> it's to, string, to string your racket uh, 10 times, right? <laughs> like, it's, it doesn't cover anything. Uh, and unless you get into the like, final of the tournament, where yes, you win, okay, 3K, right? 3,000 or like 2.5, 3,000 is a decent money to to cover the expenses if you're traveling alone. If you're traveling with a coach, mm, it already gets a little bit on the edge. But, you know, only one player wins the tournament and there's, what, like 64 players playing, right? So, uh, kind of uh, kind of complicated. But, but, you know, tennis is a sport for rich people, right? So, uh, also, that's not a surprise to anyone. We'd obviously like it to not be a sport for rich people, you know, create some kind of way of, of making it more affordable to other players because, you know, there are very many talented very talented players who who just simply can't afford traveling and uh you know and and that's that's really sad to see often you know some some players go really far to 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 look for you know those places where nobody goes because they are too far and then you all of a sudden you see someone playing like incredible tennis and you're like how, how is it possible that you're not you know in the top 100 and it's just because they can only play the tournament in their you know hometown and that's it you know they can't leave so yeah yeah, it's an interesting part of tennis that it's such a travel heavy sport. Like partly, I mean, you, yeah. like you mentioned the stringing, people don't realize how much stringing is usually like you think stringing is for free. That's how I thought in the, like many some years ago, like, you know, stringing is included by the tournament uh, as a service, but it's not like the players have to pay. And sometimes it's like 25 euros. You mentioned 20 euros. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's like if you string six rackets a day, that's a lot of money. Right. Yeah. And uh, it, it, it's something that you have to count into everything and then Food, obviously, sometimes you get food included, but the coach, for example, do you travel with a coach or you travel alone? And you, no, you no, I travel alone. I, I, I don't travel with a coach. Well, yeah. only with my, with my friends, you know, I split the costs. I don't add. <laughs> yeah, that's probably better. Like you need to find a way, like the coach has to pay half <laughs> to join <Right>. you. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and yeah, nothing is ever included. Well, I mean, when there's a 25K plus hospitality, yes, hospitality is included for the main draw players. I think it is. But but still, it's 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 a pain in the ass to 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 figure it out. For me, yeah, it's I, a little easier, right? Because you know, tennis as a player is not my main source of income, so I can sort of stay afloat. But for everyone else, you know, and you know, guys at the age of I don't know, I'm I'm 22, right? When you're depend, you're still financially dependent on your parents. It kind of also hits you hard. You know, I'm I'm 22. I'm I'm still not making money, right? It's like oh, and. And that's that's just really annoying about about the world of tennis right now. Yeah, and you need to invest so much time and, and effort. Like it's not like a sport that you can you can you know play a few hours a week and then you'll expect to be good. You have to invest so much. Also, your parents in most cases, and that's why you probably mentioned it's a rich sport. It's like it's very tough if you don't have a financial backing from 
some kind of sponsor or your parents in most cases. Like when you're right. young, you need to have your parents paying for a lot of stuff without any, you know, guarantee of, of return of investment. Yeah. Most likely none. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Most likely none. That's the thing. I remember I went to a tournament in, uh, in Rafa Nadal Academy, right? I don't know if you've ever been, but like, I mean, I know you have been. We've actually talked about it. Great academy, like the facilities, not, not the academy. The facilities are great. I've not been in, to the academy. Don't take my word for it. I don't know if it's good. Uh, but the facilities are incredible. And uh, I, was, uh, I was at the reception. I think I was uh, waiting for my room, uh, checking in. And I saw there was there's like a video of Rafa Nadal talking like on on the TV, and he's like, uh, yeah. So and and we have to to give uh, these you know kids the the opportunity to to have other sort of doors open, right? Not just tennis, because most of most of them are not going to make it as a player, right? <laughs> and like he actually says it, and it's like, and it's kind of like everyone knows it, but like the fact that he says it, it's kind of like <laughs> you know, because everyone thinks that everyone is going to make it, but you know, almost nobody's going to make it, right? Only Two out of a hundred, so yeah, that's kind of that's kind of a pain. And and you know, unlike in, in football, for example, right, where let's say that if there was a top three hundred football player, that they're living the life, right? In terms of money, they're they're covered. Top three hundred tennis player, maybe maybe they're like at zero with their expenses and income, you know. So yeah, yeah, you have to to kind of weigh in taxes and stuff like that. So like boring stuff like that. You have to realize, okay, yeah, you know, you get earnings, most likely you have to pay taxes on that. And then you have other expenses of just staying alive, right? So it's not, it's not that easy to just get yeah. everything. You're running a small business uh, with, uh, with not like a huge chance of, of success, I would say in many cases. Exactly. And you know, you don't, don't want to deter players from, you know, talented players from, from trying because it's a, you know, fantastic sport and, and a great life probably, if, especially if you make it, but it's it you need to know that it's going to be a, a tough one yeah definitely no but i still think that you should totally keep playing if you're passionate right if that's your if if you're sick with tennis right if it's if it's in you if you if you can't spend a day without playing if if you know this is your passion forget everything anyone says about not playing absolutely go for it if that's what you want to do one way or another you'll figure it out right maybe not even becoming a professional tennis player, but you will figure it out somehow, right? So like, you know, stopping because it's kind of hard to make money with tennis is is something that would stop someone who doesn't love it enough. That's true. That's true. What's your um, your kind of role with tennis been? Like, do you feel you've always been very strongly passionate about being a pro player or it's been like up and down through the years? Um, I Yeah, I've been uh, wanting to obviously like the, the, everyone's dream becoming top one or winning Grand Slams. I've, I've had all of that, right? back in the days uh, but you know it's sort of um, the, the the problem is that when I turned 18 the ITF system changed they introduced the ITF transition ranking and uh, basically I like long story short I wasn't able to play any ITF futures uh, level tournaments which meant I couldn't really compete and I didn't really know what I was training for right so I was going to training every day I was practicing five hours per day and but I really didn't have I didn't understand wh why I was doing this, right? Like, okay, I can play national tournaments. So what now? Okay, I'm top, say, two, top 180 or whatever in, in Spain. That, that's already a good level, but like, you know, what, like I can't go any further because to, to be any further, even in the national Spanish ranking, you already have to have ATP points. And I can't play any futures level b tournaments because ITF system changed, right? And my ranking does, is worth nothing. So I, I, I got stuck in this sort of like, Mm, you know, situation where I didn't really know what to do. Then COVID came. So basically, I lost like three years of my professional career uh, as a tennis player, right? And it was like 19, 20, 21 years old. And those are sort of like the years where, where you got to like push it the most and compete as much as you can. And yeah, by the time I'm 21 or like or 22, I, I go on court playing, you know, almost as if this was the first time I'm playing in futures, right? And I don't have the experience and I sort of have to start over again. And, and that's where I was kind of starting to see my dream sort of fading away a little bit. But, you know, now I'm, I'm I, I started the YouTube channel, right? I started uh, sort of recording my journey and uh, it sort of sparked me again. I'm, I'm back on track. I really want to, you know, maybe not top one, obviously not top 10, because that's a little bit, a little bit too much. Uh, but I, I definitely want to be back on tour and playing and competing and, you know, doing it professionally. So, yeah, that's that's kind of how it's been. You're you're uh, you're very good at with the camera 
extroverted guy, I would say. And so how has the YouTube journey been for you? Like, was it an instant, like, this is something I can do? Because you've seen other players, like we have Felix Mischer, he's, he's doing some great stuff with YouTube, with Tennis Brothers, and you have Simon Freund in Sweden as another pro player uh, who, who's, who's using YouTube as kind of a part income of, of his, uh, helping him fuel his tennis career. Yeah. Uh, for you, how has the, the journey with YouTube been? I mean, it's been it's been great. It definitely wasn't like a, the first time I'm like, ooh, I, this is my thing, right? Because I'm looking back at, at the videos that you know we we did, you know, when we just started. Oh my god, this it's just so cringy and and awkward to look back at them, right? I'm assuming in in a year I'll be looking back at the videos I'm making now and I'll I'll have the same reaction, but but it wasn't like an instant thing. But the journey has been great, uh, and even though you know we're not like exploding with subscribers. The, the like the fans and the and the audience that that we currently have is just the best audience I can I can wish for right they're like the most supportive and 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 loving people that I've ever met even though I've never met them right all the comments and and all the support really really keeps me going so it's you know it's it's definitely been way better than the actual tennis career right because uh, you know it's just it's just better <laughs> yeah and it's also I think you can share like losses, you can share vulnerability. While in tennis, it's only the wins that counts. Like you get yeah. nothing for, even if you have like a great insight from a loss or you can you can get some learnings, there's nothing to gain from it except your own, you know, in your own right. head maybe. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, and yeah, and YouTube has kind of, as I said, been the thing that kept me in tennis because for me, like the financial aspect of things was just absolutely destroying me, right? Because I'm the kind of guy like, I can't ask for money, right? I, I can't ask my parents, like, no. So it was really killing me. And YouTube kind of gave me, like, the base to sort of be kind of financially independent, kind of, right? I can now sort of afford to travel to a tournament myself, right? Not, not you know, asking my parents for money. And that really helps. It also takes away the pressure from me, right? Because I remember going to Kazakhstan, I don't know if that was, like, three years ago or something, and you know, uh, it was a it was a 15k I think or a 25k, and it was just one week. And I came there for for this one week. It was like a very expensive ticket there. Staying there wasn't that expensive, but the ticket back as well was expensive. Every everything was just expensive. And um, and I remember going there, and I I get on the court for the first time, right, like the day before uh, before my match, and I understand that the surface is just way too quick, and there's no way I can get used to it within a day. And I and I'm like, okay. I'm, I'm fucked, right? Because like, and obviously I tried to get, and, and I lost in, in the first round of qualifying. I, I, I did my best, but I just wasn't used to the surface as much as I tried to. The, the guy also was, I think he was uh, training in that club, so he was completely used to the surface. And, and I was like, oh my God, if I, I lose this, like my, my parents have you know, spent this much money for on, 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 on the travels and I'm gonna lose in the first round of qualifying, winning nothing, absolutely going back with a sad face. And that pressure sort of like left, right? Because now it's my money. If I if I lose it, I lose it. You know, it was my choice. I don't care, right? Not that I don't care that if I lose, but I don't care if I lose that money by trying to do something, you know, to win. So that's kind of how how this is right now. And also, I guess whatever happens in the match, you can use it to create some content. Like, and if you if you can reflect on it you can help other players or you just Absolutely. people that your fans to watch yeah. and you want to be on the journey because like obviously you don't have Djokovic doing like vlogs about his yeah. life in a private jet so right. i think people, <laughs> people can relate more about you know players who are who are struggling but who are trying and who are showing their passion and who are talking about the, what's the most common life on tour it's not like you're not going to a tournament staying in seven star hotels all the time you know it's it's a different take on yeah. it which is more relatable i would say yeah absolutely and it was also a lot of a lot of uh, like it was good news for me when i lost i remember i lost the match and i sort of analyzed the loss and i did really get some useful tips for myself that i kind of felt like sharing but i thought maybe people wouldn't really care right because tennis is about winning as you said and then i did this video and i shared like all those tips and and sort of my feelings during during the match and what I think, you know, I could have done better and sort of what people watching this video could do for their matches. And the reaction was like super positive, right? They were like, Risha, thank you so much for the tips. It really helped. Uh, you're totally right. Or like uh, a few weeks after the video has, has been published, they'd be like, oh my God, the tips you, you gave actually really helped. Thank you so much. I'm like, oh, okay. So there's, you know, people, people want to see losses as well 
and 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 you know it was also a, another positive regarding youtube yeah i think so i think a lot of players will go into maybe this journey we'll see more and more content coming up oh, hopefully absolutely. that that can help players but it can also we still need like the events like so you need the utrs you need the itfs or whatever uts now uh, if you're <laughs> looking at the moratoglu stuff yeah that's happening. yeah yeah what what are your thoughts on the uts by the way i, th I think we briefly discussed it back in uh, remember on the adidas event yeah 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 we did i think yeah. i've been in a few events for people listening and um no it's always interesting to talk about our tennis in general also about content creation and all that stuff but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in two minds. Like, I think sometimes it's too much, but I also think it's a great way of, of just using tennis as a vehicle to try to attract a bit different audience, you know? So it's it's in two minds. It, it, they go quite extreme, but I also think sometimes you have to go extreme to get, you know, get it out there. Yeah. Uh, so so it's I, I kind of like it that it's trying something different. What, what's your feeling? I'm, I'm totally for it. I love that they, because I didn't know about UTS, right? And I had in my head, I was like, we need to change tennis somehow so that more people are watching, you know, more, there's more audience, there's more entertainment. It's more of less of a gentleman tradition, uh, whatever sport, which is, I love that, right? I love Wimbledon, for example. I, I love the tradition. I love the old white, whatever. It's cool. But we have to change certain things to attract more people, right? Because uh, the guys who used to watch tennis are not watching tennis as much and the new generations want more, right? And I had no idea about UTS. And then you told me, and I was like, yeah, we need to change maybe the format, maybe the scoring, maybe something. Like, I, I didn't have an exact idea, but I had an, a, a sort of superficial idea. And you were like, well, UTS is kind of doing that. And they are, yeah, they are doing exactly what I thought we should be doing with tennis. And I'm really interested to see where it's going to take us, right? I actually even emailed them and I DM'd UTS. I was like, yo, guys, if you want some kind of collaboration, let me know because I, I'm really digging the, the concept. So. I, I didn't get a reply, but you know, <laughs> but still, it's uh, it's it's definitely something I, I'm really into. I can see why people like the the hard on tennis fans wouldn't like it, right? Because tradition tennis, five set matches, we want long. I get it, but then I also can see the sort of like the the other side, which is like way bigger audience that can be attracted to our favorite sport and make it more popular. Therefore, more money in in it, you know better living for the beginner professional tennis players and stuff because if there's more money hopefully some of it also goes down to to us the futures players right uh and uh, and yeah and you know it's it's sort of like with um um Porsche right when they used to only make 911s they used to be like that sport uh, uh, car producing company and and that's it right and the fans were all for it and then when they introduced the Cayenne everyone was like what is this, right? Like, what, what are you doing? You should be making sports cards. But then KM was sort of like the car that got them to where they are right now and sort of saved them from absolutely going bankrupt, right? Because there's, yeah, there's the hardcore fans, but they're a smaller group than most of the people watching tennis, you know? And most of the people watching tennis would like to see something different, I'm 100% sure. And then the, the hardcore fans, I guess they're still going to get what they want because I'm sure it's not going to get all wiped and, and replaced with, some, with something like UTS or like an alternative, right? They're, they're still going to be, you know, probably five-step matches or something, at least in the final, right? That's, that's how I would see it. Maybe changing something, uh, so for example, in a Grand Slam, right? Making the first round up until the final something different. I don't have a format yet, but something different, a little bit faster, a little bit quicker, but then making the final a five-step match, for example, you know? Yeah, I think that sounds pretty solid. Like, I think people even like the five set matches when they were in the Masters. This is like some 20 years ago, but it used to have like, you play Masters and the final is five sets. The rest is, is three sets. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's it, it sort of, you know, finds that balance. It keeps everything kind of clean because, you know, you never, also with the schedules, man, you never know when, when you can start a match. You know, you can never say, okay, guys, let's, let's come together to this bar to watch a tennis match because there's going to be, 300 rain delays and then the match before it is going to be a five setter and you're like okay i guess i guess tomorrow and then tomorrow you know is monday yeah no I, <laughs> it's a good point i think it's a good point and i think uh, there's there's space for different like flavors of tennis right so you have the hardcore sometimes i'm worried about like if you go i, I go go to some atp 250s for example and the first days, there's no one there, right? There's like very few, it's, there's no way the money, you know, you're breaking even as a tournament from like round one, two, three, um, qualities and so on. Uh, very few people there. Uh, 
maybe that can be changed but but it just doesn't feel like a, you know an easy thing for people to go and like on a tuesday to watch unless you're a super diehard tennis fan yeah so you know and also for the players i think sometimes it, it's a bit crazy to have like people going traveling a long distance to play one match and if they lose they're out there's no second like yeah i would prefer a system where there's maybe like fewer players but there's a round robin for for the players so you at least get two or three matches so it's like okay there's a group stage and then you get to the to the yeah. end stage maybe just for us for the players to have for example if you're a huge fan of musetti and then you want to go you travel to germany to watch musetti and he loses first round <laughs> yeah which is unlikely <laughs> but can happen you know then yeah. you're you're like, oh, I did all this for nothing, you know? And yeah. uh, if you know that he's going to play three matches, you can easily plan your trip. You know that you're going to see him. Exactly. Stuff like that, yeah. Yeah, and that's also something I like about UTRs, right? I can tell everyone when I'm going to be done with a tournament, right? Because I leave to, I don't know, Kazakhstan, or I leave to uh, uh, Belize, and they're like, when are you coming back? I don't know. Hopefully in a week, right? But I, I don't know, depending on when I lose. With UTRs, I know exactly that I'm going to play at least five matches, right? So I know that at the least uh, amount of days that I'm going to stay there is, is, say, five, right? Or six or whatever. And that's also something nice. Yeah, I agree 100%. I think that's a, it's a good point. I think that we need to be more open to changes in tennis. I think it's... it's uh, it's like keep the grand slams as they are in my opinion you can you don't need to touch them because that's like the pristine world cup whatever um but then the rest of the events you can do a little bit more tweaks with you know and try and see what happens yeah i'd say maybe start with the lesser tournaments and then transition to the grand slams as well because in the end of the day grand slams let's be honest are the tournaments that are are getting the most uh the most people watching right so if if something is done it should also kind of be a affect the other like the grand slams as well but definitely start with a with a lower tier tournaments like 250s or 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 things like that yeah to challengers and stuff and there's room yeah, to, to improve and yeah for example like the next gen finals i mean uh, that's an interesting format they have play like five sets for f up to four yeah and there's like i guess no ad and a few other things yeah. there's all the automatic that... line calling yeah what do you think of that kind of uh, format uh i think it's also cool right because actually five sets to four games is a great format because it's kind of uh the dynamic stays there the, the chance of a comeback is more unlikely than with a six uh, game uh, set but it's still it still can happen but then the dynamic of sort of like this sets stays there right set finishes okay come on i, I got the set second starts whatever like the dynamic of the of the sets stays so it, it's still a lot of fun to watch and you don't have to be five hours watching a five set match and even though yes uh, right, the final between Alcaraz and Djokovic was was an epic battle, but you know, not every five setter is like that, right? No, no, if I think that's that's the trick. You get the the legendary matches. That's why I think the final is for sure good to have five sets, maybe yeah. because it's a, also you don't want a final that's six three, six two, six love. It's not the yeah. most exciting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's an interesting uh, format, and you know, you people listening, it's interesting if you put your comments in the in the post and stuff because it's it, it's something that as a tennis community we need to be open to, maybe discuss and have ideas open and flying around. Yeah. Uh, and also regarding the final, there's only one match played on the final yeah. day, right? Well, there there can be the doubles, but but still, it's not 13 matches played. It's just it's just one, so you can kind of stretch it and and be more flexible with it. Talking about five sets, did you did you watch any of Wimbledon? Are you watching a lot of tennis, or you don't have time to uh, I don't, to keep I up? I don't really have time to watch all the matches that I'd like to to watch. I didn't even watch the entire final. Right, I did watch the entire final on the score, right? <laughs> because as I was editing, I'm like updating the score, but the actual match itself, I didn't watch all of it. Uh, and uh, but obviously, I did look at the highlights afterwards. Uh, but that's it. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I didn't really have that much time uh, this Wimbledon to to watch the matches that I'd like to. Who's your favorite uh, player? Is it uh, Novak or um, do you have some... You, you've played with some impressive players in Dubai. We're going to get to that as well. Yeah, I don't... Like, I don't really... I, I always say that I don't really have a favorite player, right? But because I got to meet uh, Medvedev and Rublev and Sonego and, and, and Kasatkina and, and all these guys uh, quite quite close, uh, because it's it's simply like on a, on a personal level, it, they became closer to me than any of the other players. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of like, if I had to pick, I'd probably say, you know, Medvedev or Rublev. Um, but that's completely biased and just comes down to, to me meeting them. But that's it, you know, and them being nice to me. But, but that's about it, right? It's not like an objective. That's why I, I, I love that player. 
but yeah, yeah I, no I definitely, definitely, yeah, Medvedev. It's been a lot of fun to to you know interact with him, and uh, it was yeah, it was fun. He's a he's a nice, uh, very open guy. Rublev is a very nice guy as well. A little bit more close, you know. He's sort of like maybe more focused on the on the training and kind of in in himself and doesn't really open that much to to new people. You know, he's very comfortable and 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 awesome and. <laughs> And jokes around with people who are, you know, sort of close to him. Because I've seen him, sort of, I've seen him practice with Zverev, for example, right? I've, I've been on the outside and I've seen him interact. And it's very different from how he, he would interact with me, right? Uh, but uh, with Medvedev, on the other hand, it's, 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 it's sort of, say, the same, right? He interacts with everyone the same way. He's open to everyone. He's, uh, you know, joking around all the time, you know, discuss, discussing things and stuff. Yeah, he, he seems like a really fun guy. I, I met Rublev briefly, but I, I haven't met Medvedev, and he's one of my favorite players because also he's he's so unorthodox and he he solves problems in a way that you cannot even imagine. Like the way he can like move like an octopus and then just he changes his stroke technique a little bit to adjust to the stroke, yeah. which is, is uh, amazing. Uh, so playing with them, like hitting with them, who was the toughest ball to to who's the toughest guy to practice with, like tennis wise? It was definitely Andre, uh, especially on on my like when i was there i was kind of like i had the stress on me because i had to sort of you know perform well and do a good warm up or practice session for them and uh and when when i have pressure my forehand just flies away right like i can't hit a single forehand properly and playing forehand to forehand with with andre was just absolutely impossible right i did my best i tried to put three four five balls in but you know that was the most right because it, it really like it looks explosive on TV, but then when you're on the other side of the net with him, it's even more explosive, right? Like you, you have to do the, the, the backspin has to be short. You have to be hitting in front every single time. Otherwise, the ball is going to fly anywhere about where you want it to go, right? And, um, and, and that was really tough. With Medvedev, it's tougher to play against him than to uh, like sort of just practice. Because every single ball that he plays goes really deep with like a lot of sort of uh, strength, right? It's not as quick, but it's deep and, and kind of like, you know, it, it gets on you. But if you just step back, you know, two meters of where you usually stand, you can handle that rhythm, right? And it's and it's sort of, you get used to it and it's fine. That's why like playing with him is, is more, is, is would be very hard because he would, you know, push you away, but then do like a short angle or like a drop shot or something. And you it would just drive you crazy. But practicing was okay, you know, because yeah, both backhand and forehand are very deep, very very hard to play if you're like, you know, close to the line. But if you go a little back, you're good. He puts a lot of like some sometimes side spin on the ball. It looks like it looked like a quite heavy side spin on some shots that he yeah. plays. Yeah, yeah, I I know what you're talking about, but I didn't really, I wouldn't say I really felt it that much. Like I didn't really feel the effect of of the side spin on on my strokes. Like it was, you know, it was nothing nothing special. Yeah, but the Rublev uh, shot, I can imagine, like, the way he hits, the, especially the forehand, is, is yeah. just like, and I mean, he just won in, in Boston and it was very impressive, just smacking the ball left, right. Absolutely, and, and mo many people think that Rublev hits flat, but he doesn't hit flat whatsoever, right? Like, that's not a flat ball, it's, it's, it goes with a lot of spin, it's just not the spin that bounces like Rafa's, it's like a spin that, because of how fast the ball is going, it kind of still bounces, but like, it, it bounces into you and eats you up, kind of, that, that, that's the kind of spin that he that he applies yeah and he, his swing speed i mean this must be one of the highest on the tour like yeah. on the forehand he just holds the racket completely flat but then you see the ball bounce the way you're talking about it makes perfect sense because you see how the ball kicks off yeah after it hits the ground so it goes kind of flat towards you but it's a heavy loaded ball yeah. so it's like just kicks up it must be horrible too yeah to I, I like to think that my forehand kind of goes the same because you know that's kind of what i aim for and that's what kind of what i do but obviously it's not nearly as fast or precise or solid as as his and i always said uh, sonigo to practice with he's it's a pretty big ball as well or? uh sonigo sonigo was awesome to practice with because it was a practice right it wasn't a warm-up uh so it was kind of more chill we even played some points and and you know fooled around a little bit on court so it was it was cool holding his rhythm was also okay for me you know yeah he would sometimes just go for a, for a winner or a passing shot or whatever no way to get to it but just on a sort of a rally kind of level, it was it was totally fine. He wasn't smacking or destroying the ball. I'd even say that it was harder for me to handle uh, Haddad Maia's ball, Beatrice. Man, because it was the first day that I came to Dubai, and I practiced on the fastest court out of all of them, and she hit super flat, like her backhand is super flat, like right, she's also lefty. So it was her really flat backhand to my forehand, 
and it was it was really hard to handle that. Yeah, I can imagine that one. That's that's tough. And uh, Kasatkina, how was how was she playing against? She seems to be very nice as a person. Oh yeah, Kasatkina, she's reason. very nice. Uh, she's also very kind, very very funny to to be around. Uh, she doesn't she she doesn't destroy the ball either, right? She gets to every ball. Uh, very like her cardio is is crazy. Uh, doesn't get tired. But again, uh, handling the rhythm wasn't really that big of a problem. So, like hitting partner experience, uh, Dubai, you, you really enjoyed it. Is something you want to do more in the future if you yeah, get the chance? Yeah, absolutely. It was a lot of fun. Like I loved that. Right. I also, I also got lucky with how my first experience as a hitting partner was because, <laughs> you know, I warmed up Rublev and Medvedev from round one up to the final, <laughs> and it's because I, you know, I kind of warmed up the finalist and the champion. And then I also got to celebrate the victory of Medvedev in his in the players' room together with his whole team, and got to meet them and and you know be a little bit more less tennis, more personal with them. And and that that's obviously something like absolutely crazy and and something I I'd wish for uh, everyone to experience. But so yeah, like I, I loved it, and I'd love to do it more and more. And also the the feedback from from the audience was incredible, right? It was you know. The video with Medvedev was the best performing video by far on my entire channel. So I definitely like to do it more and more. The thing is, is yeah, as you know, I, I told you that it's kind of hard to get into these tournaments as a hitting partner. That's why I asked you to maybe possibly get me into one. But as you know, it's it's not the easiest thing to do. Uh, but yeah, I'd love to do more and more and record the journey and and show people how the inside of, of the tournaments is. Yeah, I think that's very interesting content. No, I, I, I tried as well because I find it very difficult to understand how they select, like who is responsible to select hitting parts. Like if you go to guys who are tournament directors, they have nothing to do with it. And then it seems like it's a little bit like I know this guy who knows this guy who knows this guy who knows this guy. Uh, but I'm not 100% sure because my friend was hitting partner. He's been now in Gestad and then he was uh, hitting part. He was supposed to be hitting part in Mallorca, but then due to some, I don't know, personal issue. I have no idea exactly what happened, but then he was like not selected in the last day, you know? So he was yeah. like, oh, I'm keen to hit this week with some ATP pros. And then in the last day, they're like, oh no, no, we found another one, right? So yeah. it's, it seems like a tough, tough thing. It seems, I, I don't exactly know how the process is. It seems like they go really for the local players of the club if they can, and then, yeah, I don't know. That, that's what they usually do. Uh, I got lucky because, you know, I personally know a girl who personally knows the guy who was responsible for picking the, uh, the hitting partners so I got kind of lucky there but now I'm sort of you know my tactic sort of is to use like the the social media aspect of things right I could be like sort of like a, a marketing thing for the tournament because you know the videos do get a lot of views and people are interested and I'm sure that's kind of something that tournaments would be uh, looking for and that's kind of the thing that I use to you know sort of approach but so far um, no, no good responses. Uh, you gotta, gotta keep pushing. No, talking about like the content side of things, like what, what I've noticed in my journey, I worked with like media and social media a bit before, but that's kind of like the person who buys the, the services. But in tennis, when I talk to other content creators, Ashley and Dylan and all these guys, and it seems like tennis is a bit behind when it comes to just working with partners and, and trying to you know, obviously making money on YouTube seems tougher on tennis. Getting views is tougher with tennis compared to some other sports. Uh, is that your feeling as well? Or is this like, do you feel like it's it's very open uh, and easy to kind of work with? Uh, no, definitely not. Uh, and people seem to not, they seem to, I don't know, they don't feel the how YouTube could really improve on tennis, right? And how could it could help reach more people and how collaborating all the time with all the possible influencers could help the sport. They just almost like don't see it, right? And you have to kind of explain it and chew it for them. And when you have to do that, it's all, all, already not the, the right vibe that should be happening, right? It should, should be kind of, it's, it's obvious that if you, if, uh, if you collaborate with some kind of influencer who has a big following and they say good things about a tournament or about an event or whatever, it's gonna help your event or your tournament, right? But it's almost like they're like, whatever. And, and on YouTube, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely, you'd think it's a big niche, right? But it's not that big of a niche. Yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of tennis fans, right? Like if you look at the following of Roger Federer or, or Nadal on Instagram, for, the, for example, it's millions, but not really, right? Like our channels, I mean, your channel has how many subscribers right now? 
like 46,000 maybe yeah 40 like say 50,000 my channel is, is reaching 30,000 and you know we work every day to you know improve it and 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 create more new content and sort of find new things and stuff and it's not going you know as as it's not explosive let's say right you go to a different niche you go to i don't know car reviews or something you know there's it's a huge niche right it's kind of specific but it's huge and if you start a channel you blow up right if you do the right content you know but you know I put a lot of effort into making my content really high quality, right? Getting the right gear, doing the right editing, sort of to make it look good, microphones and stuff. And it's like, I would say, right? Like if I had to judge myself, it's a decently high level of, of, of quality of content, it right? But it's not, it's not getting nearly the attention that I would like it to be getting because tennis is just not that big of a niche, turns out. Yeah, no, I, I, I do struggle sometimes to understand exactly how that works. I mean, I talked to some other guys about the same thing and that they, you know, one take from Ian Westerman, like was that, oh, you know, you just need to create good videos. But I feel and but he also pointed out, which I think is correct, is that the tennis niche, like the, the whole niche of tennis, whether it's coaching content or the, you know, more tournament style content, because I, I think like if you, for example, do a tournament blog where you are behind the scenes, that would be interesting also for people that are not so into tennis. Yeah, so that would be interesting. I understand that if you review a racket, it's, it's not it's very nerdy. Yeah, it's going to be pretty select course. audience. But when you do like more vlog styles or even podcasts and stuff, it should be reaching a, a bit of a wider audience. But it's it's very tough in tennis. It's also been yeah. my experience. Like if you have I have friends that do other channels, you know, right. and I'm sure you do too. And then in other niches, it's much if you do like put in a lot of effort, you usually get rewarded for it. But in tennis, it's, yeah. it's much tougher. Yeah, yeah. And but but then again, if you look at like tennis TV, right, for example, or like those guys, they do have a big following on YouTube. Like it's yeah. it comes down to millions. Even tennis brothers, like right, Felix. But he blew up, right, out of nowhere. Yeah. And I talked to him about it, and I was like, so how was that? He was like, I don't, I don't understand. It just happened, right? And it happened, and all of a sudden, it just went blowing up. So I guess there is also people looking for that kind of content, right, looking for mm -hmm. new tennis content, but they're just not seeing it, right? Because you'd think, you know, he has right now, I think, 150K around that, maybe more now. And, and it went just like in the last year or two or maybe, right? It went just phew. Yeah. So there's people wanting more tennis content, but they just don't. Maybe the YouTube algorithm is kind of lacking to to sort of give it to them. I don't know. Yeah, that's interesting with the algorithm. Sometimes, um, yeah. you know, you put it, it's tough. You put like a lot of effort into content and it doesn't get anything. And then you put less effort and sometimes it just like yeah. goes really well. You don't understand. Like you put in the you know fewest amount of hours with one piece of content. You thought like it's just something to keep for this week. Right. You know, and then it's like, oh, yeah, that was the very good video. So yeah. it's it's hard to understand exactly what, what works and doesn't work. Uh, but um, I mean, I guess in your case, you would would you like to do other types of content or you, you know, keep hammering? Because obviously there's always a chance that it blows up in a month or in two months or in six months. So. Yeah, no, I, I definitely know that the content from professional tour like ATP tournaments works well. So I would really like to go to that direction. But I just don't have the the terms to do it like right like I don't have the the tools to to get to to there I will definitely keep hammering that direction for sure and then uh, the on tour sort of journey I will do as well because I mean I'm gonna keep playing tennis I'm gonna keep competing so why not as well you know share with the with the audience and then uh, racket reviews I just feel like people want to see racket reviews you know even though you, as you said it's a smaller niche and there's like way less people who look for racket reviews I still want to sort of please them as well yeah, no, but I think it makes sense. I think it also makes sense. I mean, tennis is a relatively small niche anyway, so you you want right. to do different things, but you don't yeah. want to do just like one type of absolutely. Content. But I'm still totally open to 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 making new content, right? I'm 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 down. It's just that you know it takes time and effort to come up with new ideas while you're still working on the other ones, right? Yeah, yeah. Editing is is a it's a very time consuming uh, you know Oof. job, and if you you just to hire an editor would also be good but it's also costly and you don't always get the results that you want especially yeah. when you've been doing your own content right you know? what, what's been your thinking around that would you ever want to hire someone i that? would probably want to hire someone but way further on because i like to edit the videos the way i edit them and even though you know like it can take hours to edit a video right like a 20 minute video can take 20 hours to edit like no joke right absolutely and uh but still i kind of want to get my message across the way i want it to be you know, seen across, and the only way to do it is to edit my own videos. Further on, you know, when the channel grows, when Gladiators Tennis grows just as a brand, I'm planning to hire maybe not one, maybe several people just working on sort of 
you know, different perspectives and, and trying to figure out the right way to serve it to the audience so that it's not just one person's, you know, opinion and view on the topic and that's how they show it. Uh, but that's further on. For now, I'm just going to focus on, you know, while I still kind of have time, even though, like, my schedule has become quite a bit more busy, I still have time to edit. So I'm just going to, for now, I'll, I'll stick to that. When you started the Gladiators, uh, you were two guys. Uh, Arik was with you. We were and, five. And then you, had... <laughs> you were five. Okay, okay. I didn't know that. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, we were five. It was me, Arik, Turkish guy, Kuze, Spanish guy, yeah, he was Alvaro, and, and, right? and another Russian guy, Nikita. We were five, and you can see all of them spread it across some of the videos, especially in the early stages. But then they just didn't feel like and didn't want to keep going. Uh, Alvaro and Kuze, they just, you know, sort of fell off. Uh, Nikita uh, left to the U.S., so it's kind of hard to <laughs> do anything. And then uh, Arik and I, we, we stuck together for some time, and I think for like a year we've been doing content together. Uh, but then there was a conflict, and uh, and uh, we separated. I kept on with YouTube. He kept on with his tennis. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, uh, is it much tougher to do it alone? Like, do you feel, do you miss some of that kind of group team effort? I, I am, I've always thought of myself as a team player. Right. Like I always like to have people around me working together as a team, doing the job together, spreading the the efforts. But unfortunately, in real life, the way it really works is there's one guy who is or girl who is pushing it and who really believes in it and does most of the job. And then other people are kind of around it. Yes, they do help sometimes. Right. But let's just say that the percentage is like 80. You do everything and then 80 percent you do. And the 20 percent is, is sort of split between the other members of the team. That's kind of how my experience has been with this project and with everything else. So when we did split with Arig, I felt, well, we stopped talking, right? So like we stopped being friends, sort of. That's, that's the main concern. Uh, but in terms of just the project itself, uh, obviously he was, you know, like a big image. You know, everyone liked him. He's charismatic, whatever. Uh, so that was kind of, I was, you know, sort of hesitant about it. Uh, but in terms of just the workload itself, I didn't really feel a difference, you know, because I was already doing it all myself, right? Like I was doing the editing myself, all of the gear was mine. Whenever we needed to buy a new camera, I was the one responsible for it because I knew the tech sort of world, uh, filming, recording, editing ideas. Some of them came from Arig, but then some of them came from me as well. So it wasn't really that hard of a switch in terms of just you know, physical workload. Yeah, I can imagine that. Yeah, I know. I, I I noticed that as well. I guess when you do, it's it's tough to. It's nice to collaborate, but it's tough to find someone who has the same maybe drive and ambition to to do projects. And, and it's hard, hard to find that like the balance where you share fifty fifty. It always seems to become like someone it's never works 50, more. 50. It's it's, yeah. it's just never fifty fifty. Whoever whoever's idea it was, usually is the one who's pushing it. And if that person is out. The project is gone, you know, because yes, we are a team. Yes, we're working on this together, but n no. I, and, and, you know, and yes, we're friends. So I'm not going to tell you, yo, you know, get your shit together, start working. Like, what, what why am I doing all of this, right? I'm, I'm not going to do it because we are friends and I kind of can do it. I can handle it and it's okay. And honestly, I'd be fine doing most of the work together, uh, doing most of the work myself, let's say, right? And even if we're sharing, like, right, all the all the revenue 50-50, if you're doing less than me, it's okay. Because I know that's how it works. It's fine. But when it gets to a point where, you know, I'm starting to get, I'm doing most of the, of the stuff, but I'm getting shit or something, that's when I'm kind of like, mm, you know. But yeah, and, and there have been speculations of, of our split coming down to money and financial side of things. <laughs> because people think that a YouTube channel with, like, 20,000 subscribers is actually making some kind of money but no it's not guys in case you're in case you're wondering 20k is pretty much nothing uh i could share my rev my youtube revenue with you and you'd be surprised <laughs> yeah I, I think people think that i got a comment on the video i did the other i think my uh, latest podcast um and it's like oh there's ads all the time how much money do you want really i'm like <laughs> i, I I don't set the, the ads, first of all, like you, you, you click everything because you think it's going to be balanced because there's AI to figure out how much ads before the retention gets hurt by the ads. I mean, that's how smart YouTube should be, at least. Yeah. And uh, and also like the, the money you get from a YouTube channel where you put in like, you know, so much time 
is not that much. Like you, you need that. Like I think you need that blow up effect, like where you actually get yeah. to a level of, you know, 100K, 200K, where the money starts to make a difference for you. I mean, it's better to have some money than no money at all, but it's not a money machine. Like yeah. I think people think that, oh, but you have, you know, 50K or 30K or whatever. So you're kind of rolling in dough, like give me money for my Porsche. <laughs> no, oh, no. Not like <laughs> really not. So yeah, to the to the question of, of that person who asked you how much money do you really want? Uh, some, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, obviously we we you can choose to include ads or not to include ads. Yeah. And if you don't include ads, you just don't make any money, right? So we include the ads that we can include, all of the possible ones. So, sorry guys, but like that's that's kind of how how we make a living. Yeah, that's the reality of everything. Have you um, you've worked with some sponsors? How, how do you find that process of working like with uh, with integration of uh, some sponsor from outside? Uh, yeah, I've I've done s several collaborations and integrations with uh, with different brands. I mean, my my long term sort of ongoing partner is uh, Tennis Warehouse, Tennis Warehouse Europe and Tennis Warehouse. And oh, my God, like, you know, everyone from from Tennis Warehouse, right? They're incredible people. I love all of them. And as a company, I just, you know, uh, you know, a lot of thanks to them for sort of helping me with the reviews as well, you know, sending rackets and all that stuff. And also the like the affiliate thing that I have going on with them really helps. So yeah, Tennis Warehouse is just moi. Uh, and then yeah, I've done several just, you know, other other brands, for example, lately, um, maybe you've seen on the Rublev video, I did an integration with Fantium. Yeah, I also did a separate video on Fantium. Also another company that I'm like, I really love the idea. You know, they're still struggling to make it work perfectly and fluently. Uh, and I'd like to help them figure it out because like the actual idea is awesome, right? Because coming down to, um, you know, beginner futures players who don't have the money to travel and to compete and to train, they help them, right? If you're talented, you have the chance, you, have, you can get the sponsorship and stuff. So that's really nice. And I really dig that idea. And then just, you know, sort of like investing like on a stock market into tennis players is kind of a cool idea as well. So, you know, I'm, I'm into that and yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's a fun part. Sometimes I find like it, it's tough to um, sometimes make space when you're editing a video. I, I usually sometimes like, oh, yeah, yeah I should maybe include a sponsor, like I have a sponsor for this one. And it becomes like a and you want to give them the proper because they're, you know, they're investing in your channel, even if it's a smaller sum or whatever. But yeah. it's, it's like you want to give them some love. But it, it's it's sometimes it's something you kind of forget in the process, you know. It's not what I've noticed, at least. I don't it, have it, as many sponsors reaching out. <laughs> yeah. No, me well, me neither, actually, honestly. But but it's like I, I know some guys are, for example, my friend Ashley from Tennis Mentor. He's he seems quite good at getting partnerships and stuff. Maybe it's easier in the UK. Um, I, I'm not like you know I don't have sponsors like calling me and knocking on my door like I want to be in your video. It, it's not really that frequent. Yeah, you know? I, I've said no to some in the past because it's not been relevant, but. But otherwise, it's not going to be like, you know, yeah. great calls every day. Right. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Same, same here. You're in Barcelona now, um, but you you were born in, where are you born? Kaliningrad? Or? I, yes, I was born in Kaliningrad. I don't think anyone knows where that is, but uh, it's part of Russia. It's not connected to the rest of Russia. It's a small, small little city surrounded by European countries around it in the middle of Europe. Yeah, that's, that's where yeah. I was born. And then at the age of 10, I came to Barcelona uh and yeah to play tennis and and you've been there now for uh for like 12 years then yeah 12 years correct yeah this is my so this is like 13th year in spain and how, how does spain feel like it I, I know it's pretty great for tennis uh but how do you like life in barcelona i mean the city is great the weather is awesome well now it's a little bit too hot but you know just barcelona itself i love the city i love the lifestyle that i have here it's great uh for tennis, it's it's a good place in terms of courts and facilities. Not so much in terms of academies lately, and not so much in terms of coaches. Things kind of have been getting worse because academies used to be way more pro tennis focused than now. Now they're more money focused and business kind of concepts. Um, so yeah, in terms of in terms of tennis, it's kind of been worse lately. Uh, but still, it's 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 better than you know training in Russia, obviously because. The weather is a little bit better here for for practicing. You know, you can play outdoors the entire year. In Russia, you can only play outdoors during uh, summer. So. It's like Sweden. Yeah, it's same same for me. Like you, I play on clay now when I'm in Sweden, but then otherwise it's just no chance, right? It's like it's going to be too cold. So yeah. you're playing only indoors and that, that affects your tennis, of course, because you become like an indoor yeah, tennis yeah, player. Definitely. 
Because outdoor Which... play is probably the worst surface you can encounter, and then indoor hardcore is probably the best. So if you keep, <laughs> for me, yeah, if you keep practicing indoor hard, and then you have to play an outdoor uh, clay tournament, good luck. How is your transition be to to kind of go? Because you're an indoor style player, I mean, you're quite an aggressive player. To to learn how to play on clay, because in Barcelona, I guess you play mostly on clay. Yeah, you do. Uh, now that I don't have a fixed coach, I play more on hardcore. But yeah, the usual thing is to practice on clay and every single coach that I've had not every single coach but most of the coaches especially in Spain have tried to change my tactic and my perception of tennis into a more defensive one because I have the good physical uh, sort of capabilities I'm very you know I have good cardio good legs good you know so just physically I'm, I'm well built for tennis and for I can play a more defensive game but I never wanted to play a defensive game everyone wanted me to play top spin in the back of the almost next to the fans reaching to every ball and waiting for the mistake of the other player but i never wanted to play that game i just kept you know sort of being aggressive attacking and you know but it's 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 not been easy in terms of just people thinking that there's only one way to play tennis you know yeah you find it interesting i sometimes talk to people around the tour like and in some there are some coaches with very firm ideas um i talked to apostolos sitsipas about this uh, recently quite a lot like you know how he felt like you need in today's game you need to finish the point in four or five shots kind of that's the tennis you that we'll see more in the future because you can't keep grinding probably because of the body maybe as well right like it's something we talked about quite a lot but it's it's like you know um it's also interesting because you say you got so much influence from coaches yeah but you still stay true to your tennis soul yeah whether you want to call it that. absolutely but then what are his his thoughts on the one-handed backhand in the modern game of tennis right like hello <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I, I, I do agree with what you just said. It's, it's finding a balance again of, you know, coaches advice, just physics and what you feel like doing, you know, and that's how you find the, the perfect game style and the perfect game that you will enjoy playing. And obviously I, I'm sitting here giving advice right now. I'm, I'm not, you know, top 10, but I just, I, I, I'm certain that this is the way to go. If it's like Medvedev sort of is one side of things where uh, it's like, I just do whatever the fuck I want, right? I feel like playing like that. I feel like nobody has ever changed his, his technique ever because he just wouldn't allow, you know? Because, you know, just talking to him and sort of, you know, understanding what kind of person he is, I'm sure nobody could even remotely close try to change his technique. So he just played the way he felt like and it worked, right? And then there's players like, I don't know, say Dimitrov, right? Where almost Federer kind of like copying sort of scenario. And I, fair, I, I guess it's it's finding like a, a middle ground where you kind of where you're kind of like an Alcaraz. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think it's interesting that with styles, because I think you if you have something ingrained in you, you need to kind of cultivate that, like they like have an emotion that like connected to something. That's also what makes it fun. Like, yeah, that's why you maybe started to play Absolutely. tennis because you want to play 100%. And if someone changes that, uh, you then suddenly you're not yourself on the court. I mean, it might win you more points in maybe short term or even, I, I don't know, long term, but not everyone can be a defensive player because, I mean, there's obviously stats saying that defensive tennis wins more matches because if you, people will make mistakes in tennis. That's a game of mistakes. So if you play more defensively, but then if everyone played the same way, what would tennis be, yeah. you know? And I'm sorry, but defensive game is really boring. I, I can't <laughs> handle it. Like, I'm sorry, tennis fans, but I just can't play against defensive players, and I don't like watching defensive players. Like, Manorino, man. <laughs> like, what is this guy doing, right? Like, come on. I totally respect the guy for being where he is and reaching the level of tennis that he managed to reach in terms of, you know, ranking and, 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 and titles and whatever, but oh my God, I cannot watch this guy play. I think you're uh, maybe maybe not long. I, I find it inter interesting because of the string tension and that he managed to manipulate the ball. But it's, it, I think it also creates like people get you know a defensive game style can really get into people's heads, right? So it's like you're you if you have the mindset for it and the appetite. Yeah, I'm I'm more like I'm I'm feeling more personally like you. I like to you know play residents. I also like watching guys like Fed or play people who play very aggressively. And then you see a guy like Dimitro, for example who seems to be more of kind of, he's in two minds of what he's, who he is on the tennis court. He's the most elegant player. And probably he's like, oh, I have the most attractive strokes <laughs> yeah. in, in many ways, but he maybe not found a way to marry that with his style or with his like playing more aggressive. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. 
it's an interesting uh, interesting take. You you mentioned also briefly that the one hand backhand. What's the spa place for that in modern tennis? I, I've been in recent conversation. I mean, I've been recent discussions about that as well and i'm feeling like the one had the back is starting to become a huge liability um yeah for most players you know yeah because the more top spin becomes a thing the less effective is the one-handed backhand right because whenever i whenever i'm playing a one-handed backhand player i know this is what i'm going for 100 percent. you know one out of ten times i regret that decision one out of ten and nine out of ten this is the way to go, right? Because it's especially on clay, man. Clay, it, 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 you know, if you have a decently top spinny kick serve or or forehand or even backhand, you know, it it, it gets complicated over here. Uh, obviously, there's people who manage to do it incredibly well. Vavrinka, right? Like, you know, gotta give props to this guy. Federer kind of is not that team, whatever. You know, they're at the top because they're for a reason, right? It, it, you can't be top 10 and have a good forehand and a complete hole on your backhand. Obviously, you're going to be doing certain things. But uh, as we as we if you look at the at the ranking of tennis players, most of them are, are two handers, right? Yeah, no. And I, we saw an interesting match. We both watched uh, Alcaraz beat Shapovalov in the French Open yeah. and went there with Adidas and uh, which was a good, great trip. And uh, what you could see in that match, and partly, I mean, Alcaraz is, uh, you know, specimen uh, monster, whatever you want to call him. He's like one of the one of the kind. But you also saw how his game really destroyed Chapo. You know, he's like he had to hit this high backhand just and he, he can only loop it in. So there's no pace on the backhand. He just looped it in and then he just, you know, puts it away. Yeah, so it was kind of an obvious. There have been display. several shots where he had to jump to reach the ball, you know, and he'd hit a frame or something. No, I'm also becoming a little bit more, um, you know, skeptical about the place. I mean, you see Musetti, you see some guys that do it really well, but it's kind of like a unicorn person, you know, it's like this, you, you can manage to hit it. But then that's usually the shot that breaks down when you get to matches. Yeah. You know, that's the shot you see people breaking breaking down on. It's not the easy one to just keep, yeah, like pummeling it like Vavrinka or even Gasquet, who has a probably better one-handed than a forehand. Yeah, you know, fair. cool man. I appreciate your time a lot. I know you're a busy guy with uh, lots happening, um, lots of editing going on. Probably. Yeah. What what's uh, what's up for the next Gladiator video? Uh, what do we get I'm to actually going to be releasing a video about my trip to Israel, where oh wow. yeah, I played a 25k. So, yeah, stay tuned for that. And, uh, yeah, Jonas, thank you very much for inviting me. It was a great time talking to you and discussing the, the little things of tennis. Uh, thank you very much. You have the best of day in Barcelona. Don't waste away in the heat. Uh, wear sunscreen, whatever you need to do. And, uh, yeah, we keep in touch as always. Keep in touch, man. Thank you. Bye.